Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled God's Mission and My Mission, and there's a little dash there as if they're supposed to be the same thing. This is lesson number six in that series for November 11 of 2023, entitled Motivation and Preparation for Mission. So it sounds like they intend for us to get up and do something, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for these lessons which challenge us to do something more than we have in the past in, in terms of reaching out to others and witnessing to them. May we get some guidance here that will be useful is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So how could the Jews of Jesus' day have recognized that he was God? Here's a question of right up front. Jim? Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Then he said to them, These are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms, had to come true. American Bible Society, Holy Bible, Good News. Okay. So Jesus is saying this to his disciples after his resurrection, after his crucifixion and his resurrection uh, later. And this is what he said to them. Um, even after the story of the men who walked on the road to Emmaus. So one thing that we want to notice here that's of interest, this verse is proof from the New Testament that the three sections of the Old Testament recognized by the Jewish people even today they recognized these three sections, were already recognized in the days of Jesus. The Law of Moses, including the five books of Moses, the writings of the prophets, including most of the historical books and what we call prophets. It turns out that First and Second Chronicles get put clear over at the very end, but most of the historical books are considered to be prophetic. The Psalms section, which is called Psalms because Psalms is the first and largest book in that section, includes most of the poetic books and the minor prophets. For some reason they, that I do not understand, the book of Daniel in Hebrew Bibles is placed in that third section. Perhaps it is because a careful reading of the, well, and I should be honest, some people say it's included in the, that section because the whole central section of the book of Daniel is in Aramaic. Not, I mean, yeah, in Aramaic, not in Hebrew. Hebrew was supposed to be the language of the people in those days. Of course, in the days of Daniel, it, they are already in the process of shifting over to speaking Aramaic. So is that why some people say that might be the reason? But I would say perhaps it is because a careful reading of the prophecies of Daniel says that the Messiah would come 490 years after the year of Ezra's proceeding back to Jerusalem, which was 457 BC. And that's, of course, what we call the 70-week prophecy, which points exactly to the life and mission of Jesus Christ, which they have rejected. Hmm. Okay, Carrie, you want to take on Philippians there? Yes. Uh, chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. Of course, some of them preach Christ because they are jealous and quarrelsome, but others from genuine goodwill. These do so from love because they know that God has given me the work of defending the gospel. The others do not proclaim Christ sincerely, but from a spirit of selfish ambition. They think that they will make more trouble for me while I am in prison. Now, let me interrupt for a second. How do you suppose people are preaching Christ for selfish ambition, with the spirit of selfish ambition? I can think of only two reasons, and there, I'm, there are probably more, but two that I can think of. Were some of them preaching about Christ in a sense, trying to make fun of Paul? Said, you know, ha, 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 this guy said all this stuff is now in prison. Is that a possibility? Or some of them were trying to use it for selfish reasons, printing to try to get people to support them. We need to remember that there were very strict Pharisees and people from Jerusalem 
who followed Paul around and tried to claim everywhere Paul went that in order to be a Christian, you had to be a Jew first and get circumcised and follow all the Jewish customs. So is that another part of this whole picture? Right. I don't know. We got Jeremiah, what, 613, that the priests and the prophets are motivated by greed. And that greed could be for power or influence or whatever. So it's not, uh, that's a precursor to what you, we just read there with, from Paul. If it does not matter, I'm happy about it, Paul says. Okay. So long as Christ is preached in every way possible, whether from wrong or right motives, and I will continue to be happy from our good news Bible. In our day, is it still true that some people are preaching Christ for good reasons and others for wrong reasons? Can you think of any possible examples today? Are there some who are preaching God for monetary benefit? Well, there's some who certainly have that's, that's received monetary. Pre preaching, quote, God, end quote, for monetary benefit. Sure. Been in the papers lately for just that very stuff. It's one of the greatest way to have, make a living without getting your hands callous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. In this lesson, we will study some of the motivations which impacted the early church, and we will consider how they might have meaning for us. Never before or since Jesus Christ did it has there been a case in which someone arose from the dead using their own power. In the entire history of the world, this is the only time that has happened. Yeah. That we talk about the experience of Christ. How did that impact the first people who witnessed it and its implications? From Luke 24, verses 1 through 12, very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb carrying the spices they had prepared. They found... And, okay, let's interrupt for just a second, no, just to clarify. Why were they carrying spices to the tomb? They wanted to honor... Sure, that was a thing that was considered to be the right thing to do, to honor an important person. You did that, okay? They found the stone rolled away from the entrance to the tomb, so they went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They stood there puzzled about this when suddenly two men in bright shining clothes stood by them. Full of fear, the women bowed down to the ground as the men said to them, Why are you looking among the dead for one who is alive? He is not here. He has been raised. Remember what he said to you while he was in Galilee. The Son of Man must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and three days later rise to life. Now I'm going to interrupt again. Can you think of a place that we have a recorded in Scripture where he said those words to them in Galilee? We don't have that. We don't have it recorded. We don't have it recorded. Okay. Great. Continuing with verse 8, Then the women remembered his words, returned from the tomb, and told all these things to the eleven disciples and all the rest. The women were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. They and the other women with them told these things to the apostles. But the apostles thought that what the women said was nonsense, and they did not believe them. I just, you it's know... Mary, the mother of James there. Yeah. Yeah. No, not Mary, Jesus. Okay, Mary the mother of James, not Jesus. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. But um, he, go ahead. I mean, just just think about this. A couple of these women show up, and they're saying, "We went to the tomb, and his body is gone." And and then how would you respond? Well, Peter responded by verse twelve. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. He bent down and saw the linen wrappings, but nothing else. Then he went back home amazed at what had happened. Good news, Bible. Okay. Why now, wasn't he there first? Yeah. Well. Well, there's several possibilities. One of the one of the kindest ones of regarding the disciples is remember they were all hiding in the upper room with right. locked doors because they they were they afraid they would be they would be next, but. If the women came carrying spices to, tear, to anoint the dead body, uh, Roman soldiers are not going to care about the women. So try to imagine yourself with each of the groups mentioned in this passage. What were the women thinking as they went to the tomb? 
How did the women respond when they saw the two men dressed in white telling them about Jesus? What were all those people who were hiding in the upper room thinking as they received the message from the women? These are just women. <laughs> Could never Ooh. believe a woman, huh? Yeah, Whoa. well, did they say that back then? <laughs> we don't say that now, do we, Myra? <laughs> no, do we? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. The women obviously hastened to tell the others of what they had found. Can you think of some reasons why they, those who heard from the women had questions? I mean, Peter, and then later we're going to learn John also, believed the women enough so they ran to find out for themselves. So they didn't just completely ignore the story. They had been mourning the death of Jesus for more than 36 hours. No doubt they thought, how could this information from the women possibly be true? They probably, you women, you probably went to the wrong tomb. You were so busy crying that you couldn't see very well. Something like that, huh? Do we believe that we have the good news and that we understand it? What better reason could there be for sharing it? Do you love the opportunities you have for sharing these moments of excitement with friends? Do we do that? Review the story of the walk of those two followers of Jesus as they walked with him from the vicinity of Jerusalem to Emmaus on that Sunday evening. It, the story is there in Luke 24, 13 to 35, and we're just going to assume, since we have a lot to talk about, that you are familiar with that story. Remember, they walked with him. They didn't realize it was Jesus. Finally, they arrived at Emmaus, and they invited Jesus to eat with them, and Jesus raised his hands to bless the food, and immediately they recognized that's Jesus, and then he disappeared. Yeah. Don't you wish you had a recording of that conversation? It may have been the most important conversation ever to take place. Now, that's an enormous statement that I made, so you don't have to take it too seriously. But if you look carefully at the sermons that were given by the disciples later, it may be that they followed the same pattern that Jesus followed when speaking to those two walking to Emmaus. I mean, if, if, you, if you heard Jesus says, okay, these are the things you need to learn. This is what the Old Testament says. These things need. I can't think of a better way, better outline for a sermon than that one. Yeah. <laughs> However, there are questions about what Jesus said to the disciples in the upper room. Now, when they came back to Jerusalem, the two men as well as Jesus, what happened? Luke 24, 45 to 49. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, This is what is written. The Messiah must suffer and must rise from death three days later. And in his name, the message about the repentance and the forgiveness of sins must be preached to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are to witness of these things. And I myself will send a upon you what the, my Father has promised. But you must wait in the city until the power from above comes down upon you. Good News Bible. Okay, I'm going to ask that question again. Where did they find these words in the Old Testament? We have available to us today? Or is it possible there were some inspired writings that have been lost? Possible. The statements in Luke suggest that at first the disciples did not believe because of fear. What does that mean? Later they could not believe because of joy. Was it really just fear that led them to disbelieve the women? Or was the news so amazing that they could hardly take it in? I think that's would be, that would be my response. How often does someone raise himself from the dead? Or were they just questioning the statements because they came from women? Jim, I see you to jump in from, there. From the beginning, excuse me, from the writings of Ellen White, when the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb saying, thy father calls thee, the savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. Now, now was proved the truth of his words. I lay down my life that I might take it again. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. 
Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and the rulers, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. John 10, 17 and 18 and 2, 19. And quoted in the Desire of Ages 785. So this is really, really important information. Satan had been claiming from the days of eternity, the war in heaven, that he should be equal with Jesus Christ, that he should take Jesus' place if possible even. And now here is the ultimate proof that Satan and Jesus are not the same. Jesus could have said, okay, Satan, you saw what I just did. If you think you're equal to me, try, it doing, try doing it yourself. Think of the evidence that Jesus provided that he was real and that he was alive. Would that have been convincing to you? So what did he, how did he try to convince them? What did he show them? Sorry. Scars in his hands and scars in his feet. And he, what, what did he tell them to do? Give me some cooked fish. Let me eat it. Do you think Jesus looked different in any way on that occasion? Or did he look just like the Jesus they knew? I would think well, he would look the way they knew him. Uh-huh. With maybe some radiance about him. <laughs> okay. If he looked just the same then, why didn't he look the same on the road to Emmaus, or there was a purpose. Uh, um, or, or was there was his appearance disguised? That, that has to his yeah. appearance had to be disguised. Even his voice had to be disguised. Or they they surely would have recognized him. I, I mean, I that's what it seems like to me. So imagine that you are among the group of disciples or followers that heard those first words of Jesus that evening. Would you have been able to sleep that night? What, were you, what would you have talked about with your fellow believers? I think we need to take these scenes, each one of them, and try to put ourselves in that situation in order to really grasp what, what they mean. Yeah. How much do you think their ideas of what they were going to do with their lives changed as a result of that discussion? What does it mean when it says he opened their understanding? Okay, Gordon, you're the neurologist here. He put the synapses together. He put the synapses together, Come okay. Come up with a new concept or a concept that Jesus was trying to get across. Okay, let's think about some possibilities. Did he somehow clarify to them some of the issues in the great controversy so that they began to realize the universe-wide scope of the issues that were involved. Remember, their idea was that they were going to be members of the ruling junta, or whatever you want to call it, the, the, the ruling people under Jesus who were going to control the Jews and then the whole world. They, they thought that was their idea of glory and power. They didn't have an understanding of the universe. They didn't have an understanding of anything outside of... Well, after that discussion, were they beginning to see that the mission included more than just the country of Israel? Gary, I think you're next. Okay. Mrs. E.G. White, I think that is. Yes. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. How can that be? Yeah. Aren't we the center of the universe? Yes, of course. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. I'm going to interrupt again for a second here. <clears throat> Think of how many people have the idea that the purpose of Christianity is to get me saved. And this is a direct counter to that idea. Okay, Carrie, go ahead. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. 
and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. John 12, 31, 32. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but all of the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would repeat, reveal, rather, the nature of the results of sin. That's from Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets. and says below, compare reflecting Christ, yeah. etc. Unfortunately, what we know that in the King James Version, they didn't know anything. I mean, they did clearly didn't understand the great controversy. So when they again, when they quoted Jesus there, and when he says, "When I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me," and there you see the little word "men" in italics. And what does the italics mean? It's added. It's added. It wasn't there. It's not for emphasis. Clearly, 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 Jesus was trying to say we have a much bigger idea about what needs to happen here than what you do as, as human beings in general. And they've tried to, people have tried to, tie, and even quoting Ellen White, have tried to put the word men back in. That's what they we're saying. They change her writings in yeah. many places doing that. Is it possible that having spent all that time with Jesus, they still did not understand the major issues and the conflict between God and Satan? Of course. Of course. Well, I don't think they uh, thought outside of the box. Yeah. Yeah. They were so, I mean, Jesus took them on that last trip up to Jerusalem. They're on their way from, from Jericho up the narrow t journey with all those people to Jerusalem. And all the people in that group were certain. They were so excited because they were going to take Jesus up to Jerusalem and they were going to crown him king. king. Yes. They were sure that that's what they were doing. And Jesus takes his disciples aside in that situation and said, guess what? I'm going to be handed over to the Gentiles and they're going to kill me. And three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. And the disciples, what? Did not understand it. Didn't understand a single word that he said. Luke 18, verses 31 to 34. Wow. The paradigm was too different, too much different from mm -hmm. what they had. Yeah. Well, did that opening of the minds mean that a miracle took place? That what the synapses are you talking about, Gordon? Or did, the, did he explain things so that they could grasp the full reality of what he had said? Well, that would change some synapses anyway, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. How well grounded do you think you are in understanding the Bible? Can you explain the Seventh-day Adventist beliefs about the prophecies that point to Christ, both his first coming and, and or his second coming? Notice from the quotation above what God was trying to accomplish by the life and death of Jesus. By observing the story of Jesus, we come face to face with the great controversy. The issue is this, we have a choice. If we choose to live a life as much as possible like the life of Jesus, depending on the Holy Spirit's guidance, we will be healed and saved and enter into eternal life. However, if we do not choose to le learn from the life of Jesus, we will die the death that he died, separated from his father, the only source of life available in this universe, and then we will die that dreadful, awful death that he died as a result of his separation from his father, the death that the Bible calls the second death, and we will perish eternally. Okay, Gordon? From, from Ellen White, The Desire of Ages. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Now I'm going to stop here for a second. Jesus has been crucified. He's hanging on the cross there. He's got spikes through his wrists, spikes through his feet. He's, his, 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 his crown of thorns is on his head. Blood is probably running down into his eyes and he can't, he can't remove it. He's had his back beaten and there's, blood is running down his back. And what does this say? He was so concerned about being separated from his father 
that his physical pain was hardly felt. Okay, go ahead. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. And when will that be? At the third coming. Yes. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Wow. Desire of Ages. 753. Every time we commit a sin, we are choosing to separate ourselves from God. And what do we know? What does the Bible say about that? Isaiah 59, 2 says, It is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. Wow. Do we feel the awful sense of sin separating us from the Father as Jesus did? Well, the Bible, I mean, the scriptures say, Luke 24, going back to our story, and I myself will send upon you what my Father has promised, but you must wait in the city until the power from above comes down upon you. Then he led them out of the city as far as Bethany, where he released his, where he, I'm sorry, where he raised his hands and blessed them. As he was blessing them, he departed from them and was taken up into heaven. They worshiped him and went back into Jerusalem filled with great joy and spent all their time in the temple giving thanks to God. And what did that mean? Remember that the Sanhedrin was in charge of everything that happened in the temple. Do you think they were excited to hear that the followers of Jesus were telling people in the temple court that the Jewish leaders had killed the Messiah, but that three days later he rose from the dead and was then in heaven? Don't forget that the Sadducees did not even believe that resurrections were possible. I mean, it must have been just a, I mean, I don't, what did they do? What did the, what did the chief priests do with the disciples out there witnessing in the temple court? Yeah. Okay, Acts 1, 4 to 8. And when they came together, he gave them this order. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift I told you about, the gift my father promised. John baptized with water, but in a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When the apostles met together with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time give the kingdom back to Israel? What are they doing? They're, they're still in their old paradigm. They still think that somehow Jesus is going to, you know, make them the rulers of Israel. Jesus said to them, the times and occasions are set by my Father's own authority, and it is not for you to know when they will be. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he'll be, you will be filled with power, and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. From our Good News Bible. Try to imagine yourself among the group of approximately 120 followers of Jesus in the following weeks. What did they do, and why? Why do you think Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers suddenly became a part of the group? There were also several women included, and uh, you can look at, I'm not going to do it right now, but you can look at Luke 8, 1 to 3. How do you think they decided on the disciple who would take Jesus, Judas's place? Notice that they said he must be one of the men who are in our group during the whole time that the Lord Jesus traveled about with them, beginning from, time, from the time John preached his message of baptism until the day Jesus was taken up into heaven. So clearly, there were a group of other people, probably some of those 120, that were there. They weren't chosen as ones of the two, part of the 12, but in every opportunity they had, they were following along. After choosing a replacement disciple, what did they do next? Well, it wasn't very long before they had arguments about who was going to take care of the widows and forests, and so they chose some deacons. Presumably, they remembered clearly the message of Jesus that they were to begin their work in Jerusalem, 
then to move to Judea and Samaria, and finally to the ends of the earth. It must have seemed like an impossible task. Surely they prayed together frequently and discussed what they needed to do next. And while we wait for the second coming of Jesus, what preparation do we need to be making? The author of Hebrews suggested that we need to meet together frequently to encourage one another in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. The next huge thing that took place after the ascension of Jesus was the Pentecost event about 10 days later. We do not know exactly where the Pentecost experience took place. Apparently it was inside of someone's house, perhaps in the upper room where Jesus had met with them. When the Holy Spirit descended, suddenly people who had come from many different parts of the world began hearing the message in their own languages. Peter gave a brief sermon during which he said that this Jesus whom you crucified is the one that God has made Lord and Messiah. So now that raises other questions. When Peter said, the Jesus that you crucified, who was he looking at? Pharisees. Were they in the upper room? We don't know where this, where this gathering was. In one place it says a house. We don't know where that was. Were there Pharisees who were quietly there looking for, even at this point, looking for some excuse to condemn the disciples or they were probably in kind of a tailspin trying yeah. to figure out wow. what, what had happened. It wasn't too long from then that some of the Sadducees became followers of Jesus. Yeah. Acts 6, verse 7. Well, look at Acts 2, 38 and 39. I guess that's... Is that yours, Myra? Is it? Oh. Okay. Peter said to them, each one of you must turn away from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins will be forgiven and you will receive God's gift, the Holy Spirit. For God's promise was made to you and to your children and to all, all who are far away, all whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So as a result, nearly 3,000 people officially joined the fellowship that day. It is important to notice that they were given the incredible ability to speak other languages, not for any financial benefit or just because it would be nice, but because they were expected to carry the message to the ends of the earth. Does that message still ring true? Okay. hope so. Jim? There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. During the dispersion, the Jews had been scattered to almost every part of the inhabited world, and in their exile, they had learned to speak various languages. Many of these Jews were on this occasion in Jerusalem, attending the religious festivals then in progress. Every known tongue was represented by those assembled. This diversity of languages could have been a great hindrance to the proclamation of the gospel. God, therefore, in a miraculous manner, supplied the deficiency of the apostles, and the Holy Spirit did for them that which they could not have accomplished for themselves in a lifetime. They could now proclaim the truths of the gospel abroad, speaking with accuracy the language of those for whom they were laboring. This miraculous gift was a strong evidence to the world that their commission bore the signet of heaven. From this time forth, the language of the disciples was pure, simple, and accurate, whether they spoke in their native tongue or in a foreign language. Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, page 39 and 40. Wow. So this was, uh, as Ellen White says, it's not just the ability to speak foreign languages, mm -hmm. but to speak clearly and in their own native language. And the accurate. Wouldn't yeah. that be great to have that ability? Yeah. And how much time did they, how much experience that they had with, with, uh, with Jesus and, and, and the message then? I mean, it was, uh, it, was prob it, was, it was far more miraculous than we imagined it was, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, I imagine, you know, these disciples we know were later just scattered here and there all over the place. And imagine a stranger walks in and he's speaking perfectly whatever your, lo your local language is. I mean, surely that must have said, 
you know, people almost said, where did he come from? With an accent, too. <laughs> yeah, with, an, with the right accent, yeah. Yeah. Do you think there were many among the crowd who cried, crucify him, crucify him, who later were very sorry for what they had done and chose to become faithful followers? Yes. Well, we know that there were some Sadducees and some Pharisees who became faithful followers. Think of the experience of Paul, who at first persecuted Christians and actually voted for their death. There will always be some who will go with the crowd, one minute shouting for the crucifixion of Jesus and later requesting for forgiveness for their sins. What do you think? If God was willing to forgive those, even some of whom had been among the crowds crying, crucify him, crucify him, wouldn't he be willing to forgive us? It's interesting to note that in addition to being able to speak all those different languages, the disciples were given the power to perform many miracles and wonders. If you read through the book of Acts, you discover there were times when Peter and Paul, people could be healed just by touching handkerchiefs that they had used. Or their shadow. Even their shadow. Surely that attracted a lot of attention. We know of only two or three of those miracles, but there must have been many more. Okay, meanwhile, from our Bible study guide, a core function of the early Christian church was discipleship. As new members were added, they were discipled in three ways. First, they continued to be taught by the apostles, doctrines and fellowship. The words doctrine and fellowship in this text literally mean instruction and partnership. The apostles preaching confronted incorrect beliefs and offered new explanations of, for what people were seeing and experiencing. But it didn't teach them how to live out that new truth in their lives. Rather, the application of truth to one's life happened in relationship as part of the group. New believers were carefully and intentionally discipled to direct teaching, as well as through participation in the daily lives of the other believers, all under the supervision and leadership of the spiritually mature and grounded apostles. Wow. It's poor preaching that tells people what to do, but not how to do it. However, even if one reads how-to books or listens to sermons that explain how to do things, there is no substitute for seeing people doing it and then imitating them. Paul knew this and instructed his followers to imitate him as he had imitated, imitated Christ. When others can, can see you and the reality of your experience with Christ, it will impact them as well, from our Bible study guide for Thursday. And quoting our Good News Bible, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me then just as I imitate Christ. Wow. Challenge. Think of someone in your life who you wish was a believer. Pray every day for him or her to have a personal experience with Jesus. And then raising that challenge up, whom are you discipling and leading into a relationship with Jesus? Look for ways to bring him or her into fellowship with other believers. Okay. There's a challenge for each one of you and for us. What kind of motivation should we have for sharing the good news about God? If it is not based on our own personal experience, it's probably misguided. Okay, I think that's yours, Carrie. Okay. Our life is to be bound up with the life of Christ. We are to draw constantly from Him. By taking of Him, the living bread that came down from heaven, drawing from a fountain ever fresh, ever giving forth its abundant treasures. If we keep the Lord ever before us, allowing our hearts to go out in thanksgiving and praise to Him, we shall have a continual freshness in our religious life. Our prayers will take the form of a conversation with God as we would talk with a friend. He will speak his mysteries to us personally. Often there will come to us a sweet, joyful sense of the presence of Jesus. Now, she's suggesting that could happen to us today, right? I think so, yeah. Okay. Often our hearts will burn within us as he draws an eye to commune with us as he did with Enoch. When this is in truth the experience of the Christian, there is seen in his life a simplicity, a humility, meekness, and lowliness of heart that show to all with whom he associates 
that he has been with Jesus and learned of him. This is from Ellen White, Christ Object Lessons, 129.3 to 3.130. Okay, Gordon? There can be no growth or fruitfulness in the life that is centered in self. If you have accepted Christ as, your, as a personal savior, you are to forget self and try to help others. Talk of the love of Christ. Tell others of self-sacrificing death in their behalf. As you receive the spirit of Christ, the spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. Your faith will increase. Your convictions deepen. Your love be made perfect. Christ's Object Lessons. Wow. How do you think the truth about God will finally be taken to all the countries of the world? Clearly, each one of us will not be able to go there in person. I spent many years in East Africa, and I think about the people out there in the rural parts of East Africa. How is the, how is the message going to be given to them in a meaningful way? It's just, it's hard to even imagine it. Okay, Myra? Uh, Mrs. White says, the prosperity of the homework depends largely under God upon the, ref the reflex influence of the evangel evangel evangelical. evangelical work done in countries afar off. That's from Testimonies to the Church. From okay. Okay, let's, yeah. Think about that. What she's saying is, if your church is committed to getting the gospel out in remote areas, I mean, sending money, offering help in every way you can, it's going to have a reflex effect on your church here at home. Okay, go ahead and read there. Okay. From the Bible study guide, it says, The Adventist Church's top statistician, David Trim, has statistically verified Ellen White's assertion to the, in the above quote, quotation. Okay, it's not too hard to believe that yeah. if you, you know, if you're really committed to the work so that you do want to do something about something far away, it's much more likely that you're going to care about what's going on here. Yeah. If someone were to ask you right now what motivation you have for spreading the gospel to the world, what would your answer be? And what preparation are you making as a result of that motivation? Don't we believe that the charges given by Jesus to his disciples in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, John 14, 15 to 31, and John 20, 21 and 22 still apply to us, his followers? We claim that those things apply to us, don't we? Let us never forget that God's ultimate goal is to restore the universe to the harmonious condition in which the whole universe existed before the rebellion of Lucifer, Satan. That is the thread of unity that weaves its way from Genesis to Revelation. And why does God ask you personally to be involved? Wouldn't the spread of the gospel be more effective if God sent angels instead of human beings to do it? Or does God realize that we need to be involved for our own benefit? What do you think? Well, the, what we call angels, the Elohim, ha had that opportunity, and they're, they're still meddling. Look at Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 8, and then 9. The, 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 well, look at uh, Genesis 3. The, the Elohim, the, the Satan, the adversary, speaking to uh, Adam and Eve, uh, to Eve. The, okay. There. Well, and also, as you've said, to teach someone else you're gaining as much of course for yeah. yourself you have to you organize the, yeah. your thoughts to present it yeah mm -hmm. well the seventh day adventist that's church the, that's what the disciples got with the gift of, of tongue yes. uh, uh, of tongues uh, and the ability the to Holy express Spirit. clearly yeah. mm -hmm. that was probably far more miraculous than, than in order to speak in a uh, so that people are not put off with their Diction and their their um, yeah, uh, it's, exactly. it's, it's really really uh, and they're, they're relatively short period of time. Mm -hmm. Even though they had the the greatest teacher who ever lived yeah uh, in their presence, but not everybody was there every time all day long and and and, and obviously not there at night. I mean it, it's I really know. quite remarkable. 
I don't know if you all remember the quotation. Ellen White says very clearly that while these men look like simple fishermen, she said, God knew exactly what kind of people they were. And when he picked them out, he says, walking among people, around ordinary looking people have the capacity to be, do marvelous work if, if God works with them. Yeah. Well, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a unique set of doctrines and teachings. Let us review some of these. Our Bible study guide, let's look at a few of these. Jesus is a unique source of life and salvation. People need to know about him. That's just fundamental, core, foundational stuff. And of course, John 336, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. I mean, that's about as blunt as you can make it, I think. Um, whose turn is it to read next? Oh, I'd be mine. John 3.36, my Good News Bible translates it, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, whoever disobeys the Son will not have life, but will remain under God's punishment. And Acts 4.12 was a similar message. Salvation is to be found throughout Him alone in all the world. There is no one else whom God has given who can save us. And do you remember when that, who quoted those words? That was Peter standing in front of the Sanhedrin, telling him about how he performed, him performed a miracle. Wow. The Jesus that you crucified. Whew. It's amazing they didn't cut his head off right there. Uh, they were probably so stunned after what he had done the night that Jesus was crucified. Yeah. First John 5, 12. Whoever has a son has this life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. Okay. Then we believe that Jesus is the divine Son of God. We're, we're not like some other groups. We do not believe that Jesus is somehow inferior. Jesus does not claim to be only a good teacher like other religious leaders, or, uh, yeah, or a great leader like Moses or David, or some kind of half-god or lesser god, as we find in other religions. No other major religion claims divinity for its founder. So Jesus claims full divinity, that is, equality with God. And we could actually give quite a number of verses for that, but let's read a few of them. Um, Jim, I guess it's your turn to read next. John 8, 58 and 59. I am telling you the truth, Jesus replied, before Abraham was, I am. Then they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. That in John 10? John 10, verses 30 to 33, the Father and I are one. Then the Father again picked, the excuse people. me, then the people again picked up stones to throw at him. Jesus said to them, I have done my many good deeds in your presence, which the Father gave me to do. For which one of these do you want to stone me? They replied, we do not want to stone you because you had any, uh, did, uh, did any good deeds, but because of your blasphemy. You are only a man, but you are trying to make yourself God. Hmm. That's and interesting. The, the Bible study said Jesus' disciples had proclaimed his divinity fearlessly in Matthew 16, verses 4 to 6, 14 to 16. The proof that they gave their claims was... The, for their claims was the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 14 to 20. If God raised Jesus, what Jesus said, therefore, must be true. Now, I want you to think life. about this for just a moment. You show up in a completely strange city, a people from a culture that's different than yours, and you say, let me tell you a man who lived a righteous life, died a terrible death, and rose in his own power from the grave, and now he's gone back to heaven. And the people say, huh? I mean, what did they say to convince people that this is just, just not some crazy notion? Well, we're, we're, we're running out of time. I'm gonna jump down here. You can look at Matthew 16, 14 to 16. Jesus proved his divinity by rising from the dead in his own power when his father called him. Only a God, or only God, could do that. Ellen White, here are her words. Where are we? Red Carey. Yeah. yeah. 
when the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb, saying, The Father calls thee, the Father of the Saviour, came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. Now was proved the truth of his words, I lay down my life that I might take it again. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and rulers, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. John 10, 17, 18, 2, 19, Ellen White of uh, Desire of Ages, 78, 2. Yeah, Continue. 785. Continue yeah. with the unique set of doctrines and teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as listed in the Bible study guide Okay, let's look at these quickly. Jesus offers a unique salvation, salvation by grace through faith. And that's, of course, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. No other world religion has such a salvation. Other religions indeed may see high, set high standards, promote ethical behaviors, uh, tout health laws extol a lofty philosophy or produce nice people. But these religions also believe that people can save themselves with what they do. The foundation of these non-Christian religions is that salvation comes by works. Yeah. And then the next section, Jesus offers a universal salvation, all inclusive and exclusive. That means that every person who is willing to accept it can, can accept it. There's no, no way of leaving anybody out. And of course, John 3.16 says that very clearly. The offer of salvation includes everyone in the world. The truth is that God wants all people to hear the message, the good news that God offers a free salvation based on this unique Jesus. And the Great Commission, Jesus makes it clear that we can have a part of sharing this good news with others. And so, if someone were asked ask you to summarize what the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches, what would you say? Here are three convictions. Let's just look at them very quickly. The first conviction, Jesus is coming back a second time. This coming is visible, literal, and imminent, meaning coming soon. Before Adventism got started, most Christians ended, I'm sorry, most Christians either did not believe in a literal coming or de-emphasized it. Many of these Christians were post-millennialists. Post-millennialists believed that there would be a millennium, a thousand years, of peace and prosperity here on this earth, and then Jesus would come. What people looked for and, labor, and labored for was this millennium, not the second coming. Jesus' Seventh-day Adventists believed based on the Bible that the real hope of the world is not an earthly millennium, but the blessed hope of Jesus' second coming. How many people in the news and on the government and ever are, are they, they're not saying, they're not promoting a, a, a millennium, but that's the idea. We need, to, we need to fix our environment. We need to fix everything on this world. We humans need to fix it. Well, Seventh-day Adventists accept and proclaim the promises of the second coming. And there are a number of these. These are familiar passages. John 14, 1 to 3. I'm not going to read it. Revelation 22, 7, 12, and 20. They say, listen, I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. In the Bible study guide, this coming is literal. Acts 1.11, and uh, he said, Galileans, why are you standing there looking up at the sky? This Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you saw him go to heaven. And the Bible study guide says that the second coming is portrayed as visible. Uh, Revelation 1.7 is the obvious place of that. Look, he is coming in the clouds. Everyone will see him, including those who pierced him. All peoples on earth will mourn over him, so shall it be. And I would like to emphasize here something that I've tried to say on many occasions. Those clouds are not clouds of moisture. They are clouds of angels. The Bible says very clearly that the devil will not be allowed to imitate or copy the second coming. And other places it says, Jesus is going to come. The only way you know if it's the true Jesus who's arriving, you just look up. If the sky is completely full of bright shining angels, 
you know it's the real, the real thing. All signs, uh, Bible study guide again, all signs, signs point to a near, soon, imminent coming. Jesus again and again used the word soon, and there's a number of Bible verses. God's people will see Jesus and will be with him forever. Um, John 14, 3 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Um, jumping down again. The dead will be raised and believers will receive immortality. Uh, we believe that all signs point to a near, soon, imminent coming. Jesus again and again used the word soon. Uh, I don't know how many times we need to repeat that, but that's, I mean, he, he got, Jesus didn't intend for any of us to put off the second coming. We believe that God's people will see Jesus and will be with him forever. We believe the dead will be raised and believers will receive immortality. 1, John, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 16 and 1 Corinthians 15, 53. At that time, tears, mourning, and death will be abolished. We know about that in Revelation 21. This message is important for our mission today. As many need to hear the good news of the blessed hope, the biggest challenge will be, we face, however, is the non-Christian world. Millions, if not billions, of Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and other and adherents of traditional religions have never heard of this hope. We must tell them. Jesus wants them to hear about his coming. And how are we going to do that? Got any magic solutions? Well, one of the solutions is the internet. For the, it's now possible for messages to be sent to virtually everybody in the world at the same time. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, that's way better than, even than television or radio. The teacher's Bible study guide also states conviction number two, God calls believers to loving obedience and serious discipleship. In light of God's coming, we need to make serious preparations. Faithful, obedient discipleship is important and I'm, we're running out of time. I'm going to jump down here to look at conviction number three. Um, God restores in believers the wholeness of life in Christ. It is God's plan that we be back in heaven. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, as we think of these marvelous promises that are spelled out for us in Scripture, how can we possibly meet the standard? How can we represent the truth to others around us. Here it is, spelled out for us. How can we avoid just telling it to everybody we see? That should be our job and that should be our experience. May it be so is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.